the show was so great for me because it pushed me in so many ways. Like as a singer, as someone who could see themselves as part of like a musical theater community, which is not just something I ever thought I was or aspired to be, those are all new. But as a rapper, like it was really easy stuff that was really, but for this community it was really impressive, right? And so because I'm so comfortable in the form, like it became a thing where you could, I could play so much within it, you know, and, and Lynn too. And so, and knowing Lynn for as long as I had too, like us being friends and be able to interact like that as well. Like I, I knew I was scripted to lose that battle, but I would try to figure out new ways every night to win that battle. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. David Diggs is an actor. He sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work. Is there a typical first step that you like to take when you're first trying to wrap your arms around how to play a character? I, this varies a little bit depending on the, the medium, right? Um, I'm a I'm a theater kid, so I, I grew up doing that. So most of if I have a process, as you're speaking of, like most of the foundational elements of it for me come from that. Um, and then TV and film stuff is something I feel like I'm still very much learning, um, and so that feels a little more experimental to me. And so I I try things out differently. Um, but I will say. Uh, I, I, you know, I think because, because I come from theater, but also because I'm a writer and, um, and just love, and I love words. So I, the script for me, I just try to look for as many clues as possible that might be physical clues, if that makes sense. Like I'm not, naturally in terms of an actor like there used to be for me a much greater disconnect between what my brain was doing as an actor and what my body was mm. doing as an actor and I remember I did this show um one of my mentors growing up uh, a poet and educator named Mark Bamuti Joseph and he put me in a play this is like a few years pre-Hamilton but he put me in this show called Word Becomes Flesh so it was basically like a choreo poem performed by by five black men so it's all in verse and it's all danced and uh Bamuti's whole whole thing his whole process is that words don't exist for him as disconnected from the body it was a very personal mm -hmm. piece that he wrote and so ha being forced to connect every piece of language to movement for me was mm -hmm. so useful because it illustrated how disconnected those things had actually been mm -hmm. for me as an actor, I'd always been a guy who loves table work. I like to sit down for a long time, read the script over and over again and play sitting down, not not trying it. And partially because trying it scared me. Yeah. Um, but I think getting to do that sort of changed that for me. And now I find that one of the first things that I do is I'm like, is there something about how this person talks or where they're from? Um, even if it's an, a slight dialect shift or just a pace of speech, because speaking is physical too, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a physical act that the way that noise is produced in your body is physical. And so even, and it doesn't, it can be really slight. Um, like recently getting to play Frederick Douglass relatively recently and getting to like try and place his voice in a certain place that once mm -hmm. I got that, I just need something little that's mm -hmm. going to affect my body. Mm -hmm. And then I feel confident in air quotes, confident that I'll be able to, as confident as I am about anything ever, that I'll be able to sort of construct a performance around it. But so sort of the first thing for me is like reading and trying to place it somewhere, even mm. if that all is going to change later. I just need a place for it to exist in my body. Oh, that's so interesting. Where, wherever that is, wherever that lands, it, 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 it's almost like it fools you kind of into thinking like, okay, I found that place. So now I can confidently do that. Uh, even if even if it doesn't make much sense, like as long as it's it's fooling you into thinking like that's yeah. where that is. Exactly, exactly. And it might all change. It's just a place to start so that I know I'm actually connected to my body. Right. Because that's not that is not that's not a thing that comes naturally to me. There must be something that was really beneficial to you about poetry, you know, slash rap. I'm 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 making that a big uh, mm -hmm. a swat there. 
about connecting that word wise to your to to your body like you're saying and 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 performance right i mean this like starting out like that must have had some kind of benefit yeah oh definitely i think you know and it's funny i just i wasn't able to make the leaps before because they existed as separate things in my head but i, mm. I you know i've been rapping for longer than i've been acting and um I think it's because it wasn't until I started doing a little bit of work on my voice that I realized what a physical thing the voice is, you know? Mm. And I think um, that that was a bit of a turning point for me. So, but making rap songs and performing rap songs really too, like playing rap shows is about energy management more than it's about character development, but it's still storytelling. And your job really is to make sure, and this is, I don't know, also speaks to the kind of actor I think I am, which is more useful in some uh, in some projects than in others. But like, I'm not, when I'm doing a play, like I'm not one of these guys who is not audience aware. Like I very mm -hmm. much am like, because I'm used to energy management, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm constantly sort of tweaking the, what feels like the vibe in the room to me. Even mm -hmm. if I'm, I'm here engrossed in this scene, if I, it feels like the vibe isn't, isn't vibrating as high as it needs to in order for the this next moment that I know is coming up to to sort of land right. I'll try to figure out what I can do in a scene to like raise that energy. Interesting. Um, and I still, you know, I find myself on camera doing similar things. There's no audience, um, but there is an energy in the room. Um, and it's, it's so funny because so much of what you're doing is ignoring it a lot of the time, trying to ignore like particular right, things that are happening right. behind the camera. Um, but from your fellow actors and stuff, you there's still there's still energy exchange happening. And I find myself tr still attuned to that and still finding that to be a, a useful way of storytelling for me. Um, mm. And it does feel very musical. It is, that's that's mm. how you make songs, sort of. It's this process of like, you don't, it's a weird alchemy. If you write a thing, you think it's gonna work, you record it and you're like, that most of that works, but this moment right here, something needs to happen energetically here. So the process, at least for me, is about figuring out what that thing is and then seeing how that affects everything after that. So figuring out how those things are connected has been a big part of my journey thus far and something I'm still working on. You were a track and field star, right? <laughs> yeah. I love asking actors who were athletes if any of that actually comes into play or, or set the stage for something, for the work you do now, like whether it's um, endurance wise or whether it's competition wise. I mean, like, is, is any of that true? Yeah, I mean, the physicality of it again, I think, for me, the thing that I find most useful is the, uh, being happy with repetition. Like I, that's so much of training yes. and track, particularly it's drills, drills. And I was a hurdler. Drills, 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 drills. You do the same drill a hundred times in a in a workout, you know. Um, and it's all about doing the drill, figuring out what was wrong with it, and then trying it again and fixing that thing, and probably finding ten other problems. A lot about shooting TV feels like that. Mm. Um, rehearsing for plays feels like that. It's about being not only comfortable with repetition, but really enjoying it. Um, I'm one of the, I'll take as many takes as someone will give me of mm. a thing just mm. to be like, all right, well, we got that, but here's a, also we yeah. could try this or not, or not, or we could just try to replicate it and it won't be the same. And we can yeah. see what that was too. You know, I, I, um, I like that. Uh, and so, and I think part of that comes from, from being an athlete. And I also, you know, when you're a relatively high level athlete, you know, like I've been watching the Olympics lately and I was not, I was never that good. Um, but it was close. I almost, I almost made the trials a couple of times. And like, uh, th there's a kind of superhero feeling that you have from being able to do something mm. physically that most people can't do. And then you get older and that goes away. Um, and what that is translated to for me is I really like doing my own stunts, it turns out, much to mm. the chagrin of most stunt teams. Uh, but, <laughs> but, they, but so far, they've been, most people are really good about working with me and, and giving me the necessary training to allow me to do it. Because again, it's just this moment of purely physical, when you line up on the starting line of a race, you know, 
that kind of adrenaline of like this could really like really anything could happen right now mm -hmm. and it's um and i'm gonna leave everything out there physically and um and like it's a little bit dangerous like you could get hurt mm. there are all kinds of things that go wrong especially in the hurdles you know so mm. um that kind of adrenaline rush is totally gone from my life basically except if all i'm right. doing stunts where it's like interesting yeah. like you know i get that adrenaline before i go on stage before i do a scene it's a different it's a similar thing but it's not the same because you're not in that same kind of physical danger but right. when i do a stunt it's like oh yeah something could go wrong it's not going to every you know everybody on a tv set is there to make sure an actor looks good so like and doesn't get hurt so you're not gonna get hurt but it, you could where were you in your career when hamilton came along like what what were your plans what were you seeing as your trajectory to try and um break into this i think i would I didn't have much of a plan and I don't remember ever really trying to break into a thing. Like the one I had moved to LA from Oakland a few years prior. Um, and I, that was sort of the biggest career move I had ever made. Sorry. It was me and, and Rafael Casal who we, you know, go, we, we were already working on blind spotting the film. We had our producers for that film and started, mm -hmm working with us and trying to, you know, we were trying to teach ourselves how to write a script basically, but we were doing these drives up and down back and forth from Oakland to LA, like every week, basically. Um, and we would spend a lot of time in LA and it just, there was something about it. It was like, man, these Hollywood producers really want to make a movie with us. We got to be there. We can't. <laughs> so we moved. It also helped. I had been doing a play and Marin, the Marin Theater Company, one oh. of uh, Terrell McCraney's place. They were doing oh. the brother and sister place. So I did in the red and brown water there. Oh. And uh, and I met who would at the time become my girlfriend uh, on that show. And she lived in LA, which made it even easier to, it seemed like the stars were really aligned. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Moved to LA. Yeah. Uh, and so, so we, so we did it, we got up and we moved. And that's sort of when I started clipping, like my band formed Clip with Clipping, where two friends of mine who I've known for a very long time, but we had never done anything together. And now we are all living in the same place. So we start making music together. And all these things started happening that were artistically really interesting. Hmm. And it was, I don't know if it was being in LA, but it was being totally out of my comfort zone. Hmm. And like, having to hustle for money, however, you could sort of figure out how to scrape rent together, but also um, really needing to be an artist in a different way, because like, I was so comfortable in the Bay. Um, mm. Life was like, it was coming to me, you know, it was just easy to live there for yeah. me because it felt like home. And now like the art was the thing that made me feel like a person, not my surroundings. And so I, I needed it in a different way, which I think made me work harder at it. But I was still uh, in the same way I still am, I think like all over the place. So we're, by the time um, uh, Hamilton comes along, the, we start doing early workshops. So I'm already part of Freestyle Love Supreme, which is, so we're doing like improvised rap things Every so often we'd go on small tours a couple weeks at a time, or we'd go play a bunch of one-off gigs around the country. Um, I'm also touring that show Word Becomes Flesh. And so I'm doing that. And I'm also on tour with Clipping a bunch. And so I'm, I'm managing to scrape together a living as an artist, but none of it in the town I live in, right? I couldn't yeah. make a dime in LA. Yeah. So I sort of had to be on the road in order to make money. Um, but it was, you know, sort of making it work. And it was definitely really fun and definitely really artistically fulfilling. And then I'm, when I am home, me and Raphael are working on the film script or like making web series or like doing it kind of just like a bunch of artist, artist development. That's not mm -hmm. what we thought of it as, but like teaching ourselves how to shoot things and like, mm -hmm. you know, having really just because we wanted to make stuff, but, and no one was asking us to make things. Uh, and so all of this is sort of happening at the same time. And I start doing the early workshops of Hamilton, which involved me like coming out, they would get a few people together, a cast worth of people together and sing through the new things Lynn had written or, you know, try things out. 
And I never really thought I had any business being there because um, they were all, you know, the, the first time I did, I touched any Hamilton material was up at Vassar um, at this New York stage and film thing. And uh, the rest of the cast included Joshua Henry and Anika Nani Rose and Chris Jackson and all these people who were just like, I've never sang before also in my mm. life. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so like, I'm looking at sheet music now being, okay, well, I played the saxophone. Like, I know what these <laughs> notes mean, but I don't actually know how to produce them at all. <laughs> so, like, um, and I just sort of hang out. These people are wonderful people, but I'm so out of my depth. And I knew they had me there to really try out the rap stuff on. That's what mm -hmm. I assumed. It's like, mm -hmm. but Lynn's writing some, like, barred up raps, and I can do them on the first time that he shows mm -hmm. them. So I don't have to, it won't, you know, they'll know what they really sound like if I do them. That's what I assume mm -hmm. is my function there. It's like, since you don't have a lot of time to work on these workshops, here's like a rap and ringer right. who you can bring in to really see all the rap right, stuff. Right, right, right. That's what I assumed was going on. And then when they went to the public, Tom, you know, they were like, hey, so we're going to go do it off Broadway. And I was like, with me? They're like, yeah. <laughs> and so like a bunch of things had to get put on hold kind of because I'd right. been, you know, like, right. So we're working on a clipping album. We're still grinding away on this movie. We're I was like, okay, well, I, I do want to do this now. I'm like pretty invested in it. And I really love the show, but it just didn't seem like an option. I had to tell everybody, guys, I guess I'm going to move to New York for three or four months and we'll do this thing. And then I'll be back because, you know, that'll be, well, I'll do it off Broadway. And there's no way, if it goes to Broadway, which who knows, which I didn't, I'd never been, you know, I don't do musical. Yeah. I didn't know the process anyway. I was like, who knows if it goes to Broadway, but even if it does, there's no way. Everybody right. else must've been busy. So it won't be me. And then uh, anyway, and then it ended up being a year and a half of, of my life uh, and a totally like life changing experience, right? And from a career perspective, um, but also from an artist perspective, in a lot of ways, a life affirming time because it was still the same way I always worked on everything. Still, mm. these are my friends asked me to do it. Like my friends who I've collaborated for many years. I've known Lynn and Tommy and all those cats for a decade at that point. Like they asked me to do a thing. Mm. And since my friend asked me to do it, I said, yeah. And that's what we did. And we made something that we really liked. It turned out it hit, but like, the fact that it could hit that big. And for me, the process of accepting it and being open to it was still the same. It was really gratifying and affirming to me. Um, it didn't pressure me to change the way I had gone about accepting work or looking for work in my mm. life, you know? And was it, was it, I know this is a weird question, but was it, was it a little bit like sad to have to put all those other things on hold because you're 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 kind of a person that needs it seems like needs to have all that going on and different sides of uh like the writing and and the performing in both both aspects of rapping and and acting like was that even though it's like amazing you're off broadway but was that actually um something that was kind of like a downer in a, in, a, in a weird way to talk about it like that. Yeah, it really would have been if I didn't have the friends and collaborators that I had, but I do. And so they actually wouldn't let me, like Raphael moved to New York. He was like, I get it. Mm. You're swamped and you're doing a thing that's important and you're not good at email anyway. And you're not, you, you like are really sometime you would text. So like, I'm going to come there mm. and like, I'll just hang out in your dressing room or whatever. I don't know. But like, I think we're, we're not getting anything done this way and maybe we'll get something done like if I'm there. Mm. So we moved to New York and we did exactly that. That's I'm cool, Broadway, yeah. hanging out in my dressing room. Mm. And like every time I would get off stage, you come in there and we'd like talk about the film or one of the various other things or whatever. And then I'd run back on stage to the thing, you know, so, yeah. um, so I still got to sort of live this, this multi-hyphenate lifestyle that I'd become accustomed to. And the same with my, my clipping collaborators, like, kept making music, kept sending me beats. We kept hmm. on the weekends talking about the album we would eventually make. And, you know, so it, it kept all those sides of the brain firing. And it was a good learning experience for me about, um, you don't, I don't, there's not actually a long amount of time. I think that you have to give a hundred percent of yourself to something artistic. There is part, you know, hmm. certainly in the building phase that it's helpful. Um, but like, you know, my experience with Snowpiercer now versus the first season, I was so like out of sorts trying to figure it out. Mm. And now if I didn't have those other things, I would be terribly bored. 
mm-hmm. in Vancouver, you know, mm-hmm. because it actually requires very little of me um, to do mm-hmm. that show, mm-hmm. relatively speaking. And so it's actually been great this season. We were editing the TV show while I was in quarantine. Mm. Um, and so we were editing a blind spotting TV show yeah. while I was in quarantine, waiting for Snowpiercer to start. Um, and significantly into the first couple of blocks, we were still in the edit. So I got to come to my trailer and, you know, get into the virtual editing suite and sit there and talk to the editors about this thing that was occupying a ton of my passion and my, right, you know, right. so, and the usefulness of that is that like your heart is still engaged then when you go back to your other That's gig. Interesting. It's yeah. Like, it almost know, feeds exactly. that other, the, it almost feeds the other work. The work, the ship runs on enthusiasm. Something yeah. me and Raphael always say, you know? Yeah. And so I got to be juiced about something. And like, honestly, every day of TV is not exciting. Right. But like, if I am excited about something, that energy can carry over. And I can be like, even if the energy is like, guys, we got to get through this so I can get back to, you know, it, right. it's still energy exchange. Like we're talking about. Right. I didn't have the, opportunity to see you on the stage in Hamilton. So the first time I saw it, it was, was on my TV, which is, you know, sad, but still amazing. But what struck me about your performance was, and I know you, like you put confidence in quotes earlier, but I, I, I wrote this down. Like you have, you had a striking confidence moment to moment in this thing. Like, mm-hmm. like there's, there's a lot of performances that I find like superlatively successful that don't have that. And, and people were like laughing pre, pre, before you were saying things after a while and, and, yeah. and like, like anticipating cause we were, and I felt like I was that too. Like, I know I'm going to laugh at <laughs> this. Like that, that's an, that's an unusual experience for me as an audience member. Like I'm so invested in them entertaining me that I'm almost entertained before the entertaining moment. <laughs> but w- can you explain that? Can you explain, like, did you just settle into some kind of thing after a while or was it because you were, you, you were, you, you were there from before the beginning? Is that part of it? It all is part of it. I think, you know, the, the version that was recorded is a, is a version more than well over a hundred shows in. Right. So there's right. that also. So we've been doing it. We're very comfortable with it. Um, there's the fact that the show was so great for me because it pushed me in so many ways. Like as a singer, as someone who could see themselves as part of like a musical theater community, which is not just something I ever thought I was or aspired to be, those are all new. But as a rapper, like it was really easy stuff that was really, but for this community is really impressive, right? Mm-hmm. And so like starting from that place of confidence is like, for, for, at least on the technical side of things, like mm. I knew I was gonna nail that every night. And yeah. those had proven to be kind of the favorite moment, you know, or really memorable moments for people that really loved like Lafayette's fast rap, which like, is not that fast, <laughs> but it is for this community, you know? Right. So like, there were these things, it was like, and the cabinet battles always, they always went, like people yeah. always enjoyed them. Like that, yeah. And so, because I'm so comfortable in the form, like it became a thing where you could, I could play so much within it, you know? And, and Lynn too. And so, and knowing Lynn for as long as I had too, like us being friends and be able to interact like that as well. Like I, I knew I was scripted to lose that battle, but I would try to figure out new ways every night to win mm, that battle because why not? Because we're here and we're doing it hundreds yeah. of times. And I, and I, and Lynn is, you know, an incredible improviser also. So he was going to take anything that I threw at him and like throw it back at me. So like, it does, there was a certain, there was a confidence in, especially by the time of the recorded performance mm. is a huge amount of confidence in the show itself. The show works. The show was going to work whether I was in it or not. Turns out like that show works my parts of it. Like I was very comfortable in the role and in the material. And so there's that. And there was such a confidence in the group of people I was around that we could play. And so the secret sauce for me was just about having as much fun as possible every night. Yeah. And that meant if I wasn't getting from it from the audience, I was going to get it from my castmates. And if, uh, and then the, the occasion where you got it from everybody, it's this really mm. beautiful thing because mm. 
And Jefferson in particular is in this sort of rarefied air where you get to wink at the audience all the time because like he's so full of himself that he knows people are watching him. <laughs> he believes that people are watching him at any given point. So if there were a camera, he was gonna look straight down the barrel, right? <laughs> and so, so particularly once you hit that second act, like, and you can develop this relationship with, with the audience in the space, like there is, there it did feel like there was that kind of energy exchange where mm. and at that point everybody knows the show too so you're going out there and people right. are excited to like see the number and you get to see that they're excited about seeing the number and if you look at you know you can see somebody in the first row like starting to lose their shit and you can make fun of them <laughs> losing their shit you know like it's uh it's great it's great those things became so much more like concerts by the end of it than they right. were like plays because right. people were so invested in it Interesting. Uh, yes. Yeah. Felt like being a rock star. Wild. Well, so for somebody who is so sensitive to energy like that, though, was it ever a point where it's like this energy is almost too much? It's almost like this, <laughs> this, 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 this overwhelming energy that's not um, that I can't fit into. It's almost like that thing, that aura about there that is the audience is so is so happy to be there, so uh, expecting of everything that it's almost like a impenetrable wall. Or something like that. I think it requires so much back from you. And so when I stopped performing the show was when I stopped feeling capable of giving that every night. Mm. That's what what became clear was like people were like mortgaging their houses to get in these things. The tickets were so expensive and it was so you know, like um and everybody in there felt so lucky to be there. Mm -hmm. Um and you really did want to be able to give that all back to them. Um and they deserved it, they were, you know? And so right. when I finally, you know, a year and a half into it felt beat down enough that like, I didn't have that anymore. And like, even the, even the joy of the experience wasn't enough to keep that coming back for me. That's mm -hmm. when I asked to leave, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I, I realized that like, it was gonna affect the show if I was still, it, it asked so much from mm -hmm. you energetically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just at the show. It's also when you leave the show. You know, people right. are so high off that show. Everybody right. wants to come on stage. Everybody wants to come back. So it's great. It's beautiful. It created community in a way that, like, we used to take over 46th Street uh, a couple of times a week just as, like, a 15-minute block party, like, <laughs> right before call time. They would block off the streets, and thousands of people would come out just to be Crazy. near the thing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the way it created community was really really special but it asked a lot of you walking around new york at that time too just like being on like that uh, was was a lot and so when i when it became a, a very heavy burden i stopped doing it <laughs> in those weeks leading up to it being a heavy burden like can you detail a moment where you needed to pull from somewhere else to even step on the stage like, did you ever have a night like that where you're like, this is getting to be where I don't have what I need right now to even um, um, rise to the occasion of this energy? And, and where did you pull it from to actually get up there? Yeah, I do remember one time like walking to the, or I, I was taking the subway to the theater. I was living uh, uptown on 146 and I taking the subway down and like, you know, I had my like hat on or whatever, and my headphones in. I'm just trying not to be. And like, several people had recognized me and were talking to me, and like, you know, I'm smiling and like having conversations, but really like trying to get rid of people. And then Times Square was nuts that day, and trying to get through it, just like the sea of people and like 10 to 15 more people. Oh my God, you know, like whatever. And I was just. And they were so happy and I was so angry. I was just mad, you know, I ha it hadn't been a good day. And like, but I was also, I, I was not letting go of it in the way that I usually do. Mm. I got into the theater and like, I was, and I'm so rarely in a bad mood, actually. I was just like in a bad mood. And me and Oak used to uh, stretch together every, every day before the thing, like with our foam rollers, like on the stage. Mm. I was doing that. Um, and I think maybe I asked him, either I asked him or he just knew, because, you know, we we're really close at that point. I spend the whole the whole show with him, right? We're kind of inseparable from the show. So 
I can't remember if I asked him if he just sensed it, but he was like, I got you. And he told me jokes on stage the whole night. Wow. Like he just like talk shit the whole night. And Oak is the most fearless actor I've ever worked with actually. Um, and he would just, it didn't matter if the mic was on or not. Like he was, he, he made it his like personal Beautiful. mission to make sure that I was happy, like that I was laughing on stage. Wow. And so like, that was it. I did have the great fortune of seeing you in white noise though. Oh, word. Oh, amazing. And that was really impacting for me, man. In a, in a... <laughs> and the conversation with my wife on the way home was also very <laughs> <laughs> interesting yeah. for us. Yeah. I think a lot of people had that experience. Oh like, yeah. In show and it being like, not necessarily like a night, what you expect after yeah. a night at the theater. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. There's so many things to talk about that, but, but so don't, this might be a belittling thing to talk about, but did you actually make a quiche every night <laughs> on stage? I mean, from scratch. Man, I had to go through the motions. It didn't have to be edible. So it looked like it was though. It looked like after a while, it was just like, he's doing yeah. this. I know. Yeah. We cut, we cut a lot of corners on the things that would actually make it taste good. And then like, <laughs> and you really just are putting it in the microwave, but that was part of it too, is that you smell the eggs cooking, right? And it so, wasn't like, even a microwave it, though. It was like a, it was like a, uh, a portable oven. Like toaster. Yeah. If it was a microwave, I would have, I would have left. It would have been like, nah. Yeah, yeah. It would have been like, I don't want, who wants to eat that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was, uh, but, was, but was that, but it, was having something to do like that helpful? Like, like, because you did that for like a long time. It was like a half hour as yeah. the play is going. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'd sort of forgotten about that. I mean, we knew that it was going to have to become a very second nature thing. Yeah. So it was in that way helpful. It was helpful because we knew it was going to be the one of the obstacles. It was a signpost in the show. When we get to this moment, this is going to have to feel like breathing. Yeah. So we knew we were going to have to rehearse a lot. So really, like, as soon as we were up on our feet, we were rehearsing that one. Like, it was like, let's fig let's set this now so that yeah. by the time we're finally at the run, like, it's not tripping you up at all. Um, and so in that sense, like, it was, it was really useful. It's nice. Anything that gets me out of my head is, is useful. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so that was good. Um, but I think... It, yeah, that, that show is just brilliant. And I think the, the moments of tension that it was creating that were that evolved over oh, the course yeah. of the show, mm. but by the fact that, you know, based on how I'm feeling about Tommy Sadowski that night, you know, like yeah. whatever, you know, sometimes it's like, wow, oh man, it's pretty great to just cook for my friend. And then like <laughs> some nights it was like, this motherfucker really thinks he owned me right now. Like how, you know, <laughs> um, and whatever it was, is going to culminate yeah. in this bowling match at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like such a wild thing. Yeah. You know, so it's the, the construction. I mean, Susan Murray Park, so obviously, but like yeah. the construction of that show formally really allows that moment in the bowling alley to be different every night, to feel mm -hmm. like, it is a culmination of everything that you've experienced over the last, you know, couple of hours mm. and you just let it out in this, in this bowling match. Yeah. Um, and did, and did, did he feel the same way too, uh, uh, uh Tom, uh, uh, about, about that? Like, like, did he rise to the occasion of that, like flowing with what, with, with the energy? I, th I think so. I hope he felt like I was, you know, giving it back to him enough. Like he, Tom, he's, he, Tommy's got, on stage like that dude's got energy like he can he's really really he's so good he's so good it was such a dream getting to work with him he just um so yeah but i mean there was always a nice like sort of give and take there and like yeah. who, you know playing really playing for the points you know seeing who could who could win this one and like feeling when you lose a point one of the first people i talked to on this podcast was sheila vand and she was talking about yeah. how, yeah, about how excited she was. This was how long ago this was about this show that she was doing. They, they did one episode, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then last last December, I had uh, Allison Wright on, the amazing Allison Wright, and she was talking about this this filming this next season. But they both had this 
thing and I was afraid to ask. It felt like, <laughs> like, is there something, is this show just hard to do or something? Like, like what is, is, is it this set? That's, that's the problem. Is it being away and being on this set? Is that, is that for Snowpiercer, of course I'm talking about, is, is, yeah. is this the problem? It's just the way this is made? It is, I think it's a combination of things with that show. Uh, Obviously, I don't know when you talk to Allison, but like the last year of shooting was not uh, for everybody making anything. Right. Um, because of the, the quarantine of it all and not being able to leave and all that stuff. But even before that, it's a show that is super intense, that requires a lot from you, like physically and emotionally. You know, it's action, action, action. Um, but doesn't always it, it here's the here and it's brilliant actors on this show right like yes and i think brilliant actors who are used to working with text that is like pretty elevated and it's not that this text mm. on this show isn't but there are so many events because of the kind of show that it is Mm -hmm. um, that oftentimes it can start to feel like it's a show about the events that's not giving you what you need to reach the emotional truth of mm. the moment. But that doesn't mean you don't have to do it, <laughs> right? right. So you, you still have to go there, even though you know that the show doesn't necessarily care about it. But like, it's the only way you're gonna get like the show itself, not anybody on the show, not the writers, it's not any yeah. of that. It's not a thing like that, it's just that the, to me, the nature of this show sometimes is that it has to be so much more concerned with what is happening than mm -hmm. the people it is happening mm -hmm. to, because mm -hmm. it has to have this forward motion. Uh, otherwise, it feels like the train is holding still, right? right? So like it has to feel like the train is moving all the time. And that is about action. And so I think sometimes we would, like, everybody had this at some point or at various points, you come to set, and you just like have to muster up a way to care about a scene that isn't about what your character is going through at all. It actually yeah. is just about getting you through this car to the next car so yeah, that the action yeah, can yeah. continue. But that doesn't mean you can not give this performance. It doesn't right. mean I can just walk from one side of the car to the other. You still have to, and it's, I think if the show works for people, I think that's why it works because like all of these actors have figured out a way to do this and each of us figure it out in our own ways. But like, Someone like Alice, I think Allison is so stunning on this show. She would too, all yes. of them. But like, I think Allison is so, such a phenomenal actor. And what I've watched her do in these scenes, I, I'm always so thankful when I'm acting with her because she does, so she figures it out. We're in the like couple of minutes of rehearsal that we're gonna get and we're breaking it down. And she'll be like, this is, this, is, I, this is what I need here. From a character perspective, this is what I need in order to be able to say this thing that just opens the door. I know mm. it just opens the door, but I need this. Yeah. If we can find this, I'm good. And we figure it out and we find mm -hmm. it. And then she's brilliant, yeah. you know? And yeah. like, it's such a, it's always such a lesson to me. Working with Jennifer is like that too. Like my, working with great actors is so great because like I get to steal their process. And um, yeah. those two in particular, like are very good about being like, this is what I need. I understand what the show needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And I want that to happen as quickly as anybody else too. Mm -hmm. Here's what I need in order to play that appropriately. Yes. So let's take the time to figure that out. And then when you do, I'm going to give you a brilliant performance on every take. You'll be able to use every single take. And that's I, that's the way I feel about when I'm in scenes with Alice. And there's never been anything unusable that she's ever done. I'm not that guy necessarily. <laughs> like I do a lot of playing around in front of the camera. You might get one. Hopefully you didn't run out of time. But <laughs> and just that idea of, of knowing when to speak up, knowing when to say what you need. As an actor, it feels like actors like don't know that it's something th that they have to learn or something. It's it's, a, it's, a, it's hard. It's hard to do in that situation, particular TV, particularly TV. It moves so fast, um, and you're so aware of the dollars actually that are mm. being spent. Every TV show I've ever been on, I feel this way. I am somehow acutely aware that every minute I'm spending a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> whatever it is, you know. So like, <laughs> it is. It does. You sometimes feel like you don't have the right to be like. Hey, I know it's just, I know it's just acting, but like, I actually just, I don't, I can't do this if I don't, sometimes you feel like you don't have that right. It's the, the people who I've had the fortune to work with, who I think are truly great are the ones who are, understand the value of what they're giving in that space. Mm -hmm. Who are like, particularly the women, there's such a, it's such a hard thing for women, I think. And that 
I, mm-hmm. I may have done things that are more like worthy of the description diva than Allison ever has, but I bet no one will ever call me that. And I right. bet she has to worry about that all the time. Right. You know, like I bet Jennifer has come across that so many right. times in her life or Mickey Sumner and the wonderful women I work with on the show, Sheila, like yeah. they probably come across that all the time, but literally I could have, and I've been, I've, I've seen this happen. I'll have the exact same conversation that they've had with the, a director or whatever and nobody blinks an eye mm-hmm. they have it look around the room and maybe there's an eye roll or someone's looking at their watch or like you know like the this idea of women speaking for what they need even you know and it's even now even in the place we think we are yes. as an industry like these things are ingrained into it this idea of a diva is like really entrenched in yes. the industry and That's it's right. um, it's gross and it's and it and it makes me applaud even more of the women who I watch do it and then sit back and watch their performances. And it's like, that's why, that's why, mm-hmm. that's why your show's good. Actually, mm-hmm. you should beg every actor to do this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> David Diggs, I hope we can do this again one day. Anytime. This is the best. I'll do this all the time. It's so fun. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.